Let us look again at the notched flow. As before, the only vorticity present in the straight channel is normal to the streamlines and in a horizontal direction. With a vorticity probe, we can investigate this flow. Since the horizontal leg of the fluid cross does not rotate, we can concentrate our attention on the vertical leg. We can think of a line of bubbles originating at a vertical wire as a sort of composite of all vertical legs of all the crosses. The plane swept out by the rotation of this composite vertical leg is perpendicular to the local vorticity. From above, we see an edge-on view of this plane. Now let's look at the bend. Is the plane swept out by the bubbles from the vertical wire still perpendicular to a typical vortex line created upstream? It is indeed, showing that the vorticity was transported by the fluid and was truly marked by the horizontal bubble lines coming from upstream. We must be careful, however, to make our observations reasonably close to the vertical wire so that they are truly a measure of conditions near this point. Thus, in a frictionless flow, an understanding of the secondary flow in a bend can be obtained from a knowledge of the upstream flow. We can now remove the device which produced a special velocity gradient. And use the channel as a simplified model of a river band. What flow pattern can we expect? The velocity gradient indicates the presence of vorticity perpendicular to the streamlines in a boundary layer at the bottom. In the bend, the radial view fairly closely resembles what we saw in the teacup model. The tangential view also looks very similar. Let us examine this fluid line carefully and see if we can relate this boundary layer phenomenon to behavior we observed before. The straight portion of the line leading away from the wire is close to the bottom wall. Here local friction is very important and we can no longer assume that all the vorticity has come from upstream. It is not surprising to find that the plane swept out by this portion of the vertical bubble line is far from perpendicular to the vortex lines created upstream. The elbow is a transition region and the portion of the fluid line leading up to the primary flow is in the outer part of the boundary layer. Although all of the boundary layer was created upstream by friction, this outer part behaves in a nearly frictionless manner in the bed. The plane of rotation of this portion of the vertical line is almost at right angles to the vortex line from upstream. We saw this behavior earlier in the notched flow. The transverse vorticity created upstream in the boundary layer has caused streamwise vorticity in the bend. If we look a little further downstream in the bend, we see that the vorticity is gathering into what is called a passage vortex. Here the flow is not so simple. 
Secondary flows are frequently very complex and difficult to interpret, and their causes are often obscure. In this channel, for instance, unwanted secondary flows appeared, which were finally traced to the frictional effect of a dirt film on the surface of the water. It has been useful to use a carefully cleaned up laminar flow in order to observe these simple secondary flows in detail. But flows in rivers and pipes and ducts are rarely simple or laminar. If we were to make this flow turbulent, it would be harder to observe, but the same general flow patterns would occur. Secondary flow in a curved channel acts to displace the normally slow-moving fluid near the walls and replace it with fresh fluid having higher velocity. Thus, it greatly increases the exchange of momentum between the fluid and the walls. This increased momentum exchange explains in part the increased friction experienced in a curved pipe, even when the curvature is sufficiently gentle so that separation does not occur. In this case, the increased friction is explained by the displacement of boundary layer by fresh fluid. Not only is friction in the bend itself increased, but secondary flow persists in the pipe downstream, and for a considerable distance, friction is increased. Material, as well as momentum, may be transported by secondary flow. The meandering of rivers and the ever-changing riverbed is the result of silt carried by the stream. And while the phenomenon is complex, there is no doubt that secondary flow plays a large part. Clearly, there are other classes of flow which can be approached by stepwise approximation, postulating a primary flow and deducing a secondary flow. In fact, the term secondary flow has been used to refer to many different phenomena. We have studied one class of secondary flows, those which result when flow with vorticity has been made to follow a curved path. Here is a more complicated example of secondary flow. When the shear layer on the bottom meets an obstruction, say a bridge pier standing in a river, a horseshoe vortex is formed around the obstruction. The resulting shear stress on the bottom can undermine bridge piers by scouring. This is to be expected since the shear stress directly under the vortex is an order of magnitude larger than normal. And what is even more surprising, it is in the opposite direction. <laughs>